Our next topic is climographs, which are probably the most important tool that we will use to study and classify climates. A climograph is simply a graphical representation of monthly temperature and precipitation data at a specific weather station. First notice that the x-axis represents the months of the year, January, February, March, etc., up to December. Next notice that the temperature is represented by a, a line graph using the left y-axis. And precipitation is represented by a bar graph that uses the right-hand side y-axis. This particular climograph is for St. Louis, Missouri. And you'll notice that the textbook climographs also include a map to show the location. They also show the latitude and longitude of the location. They show the temperature range, summer to winter, and also the total precipitation. Let's look at the temperature profile on this climograph. This station is in the northern hemisphere, and, and we can see that from the latitude up here. But even if they didn't tell us that, you should be able to figure out that this station is in the northern hemisphere simply by looking at the temperature profile. When are the warmest months of the year? In this case, the middle six months are much warmer than the outer six months. So we know that this is a northern hemisphere station. If this station was in the southern hemisphere, it would be inverted. The warmest months would be in these outer six months, January, February, March, October, November, December. So it would look more like this, if you can follow my cursor. The warmer months would be on the outside, and then the middle six months or so would be the cooler of the six months. As we look at more climographs, get in the habit of initially just looking to see which hemisphere you think the climate station is in. Next, based on our discussion of temperature profiles three weeks ago in Chapter 4, would you expect this location to be a coastal station or a continental station? And why? Yes, I know you can see a map here, so you can just look at the map and see that it is indeed a continental station. It's in the middle of the continent. But how could you tell just by looking at the temperature profile? Remember that continental locations have warmer summers and cooler winters than coastal locations. Since this station varies considerably from summer to winter in terms of temperature, you can make a pretty good guess that it's probably a continental location. Next, consider this climograph for Singapore. Based only on the temperature profile, where would you predict that this station is? In the tropics, the mid-latitudes, or the polar regions? In particular, notice that it is always warm. Quite warm, really. And the temperature is so consistent, it's actually a little bit hard to tell if it's in the northern or southern hemisphere. So do you think the location of this station is equatorial? mid-latitude or polar? Yes, I know you can just look at the latitude here and know that it's near the equator, but try to do it just by looking at the temperature profile. The temperature is consistently high year-round and there's basically no seasonality to it at all. This implies that it's near the equator, because near the equator you get pretty intense sunlight all year-round, and there's not much in the way of seasons. Next, let's look at the temperature profiles. We're back on the St. Louis climograph here. Is there any sort of dry season, or is precipitation pretty much year-round? In this case, it's pretty much year-round. Think about what second letter in the climate type that would indicate. Also, what sort of uplift would you expect to be important here? Do you remember the four types of uplift from last week? The type may vary a little bit with the seasons, but probably a lot of convective uplift in the, in the center of the, of the continent. Next, next, let's look at Singapore. 
Clearly there's no dry season here either. They get a ton of rainfall. So both of these two stations probably have an F for the second letter of their climate. Remember, F was feucht, which was the German word for wet, wet year round. Wow, check out how much total rain they get in Singapore. 94 inches. Seriously, not a desert. So let's put it all together and figure out what climate type each of these two stations is. First, let's just consider the first letter of the climate. Is Singapore an A, B, C, D, E, or H climate? Based on the year-round year very consistently high temperatures, we were guessing it was an equatorial station, so it's probably an A climate. Tropical humid. Next, let's think of the precipitation pattern. The second letter of the, each climate type generally refers to precipitation. We notice that Singapore gets an amazing amount of rain and it's pretty consistent year-round. There's no dry season here. So that would lead us to believe that the second letter would be F. So, so far we have AF for our climate type. And it turns out since A climates are generally very hot year-round, they don't even bother with a third letter. I guess it would all just be A if they did. So A climates are a little bit unique in that they don't have a third letter. So that means we're done. It's an AF climate. You can see the climate graphs in your book. Generally put the climate type up in the upper right hand corner. Indeed, an AF climate. An AF climate actually has a specific name. All the tropical humid climates have specific names to them. AF is tropical wet. That makes sense. The first letter basically says it's warm, tropical. The second letter says it's wet. It's a tropical wet climate. Our rainforest areas of the world. We're going to study those in more detail in the next video clip, but you can see them in the dark green here, centered pretty much right on the equator, where it's warm and wet year round. Next, let's go back to St. Louis. What do you think the first letter is for this climate station? It's definitely not an A climate. It's not warm year round. Nor is it a B climate. It's not dry at all. Notably, there's significant variation from summer to winter in terms of temperature. So if I had to guess, I would guess it's probably a D climate, a severe mid-latitude climate. The mild mid-latitude climates wouldn't have as much variation in temperature from summer to winter. Yep, it's a D climate. All right, now what about the second and third letter? Well, we already said it gets year-round precipitation. There's no distinct dry season in the summer or in the winter. And it doesn't get nearly enough rain to be a monsoon. Usually monsoons get over 100 inches of rain. This one is going to be another F for the second letter, wet year-round. For the third letter, we need to know a little bit more about climate classification to determine this for sure. But we can pretty much eliminate cold and cool because the, the third letter represents summer temperatures. And you can see it gets quite hot here in St. Louis in the summer. It's probably either warm or hot, but based on the fact that the average temperatures are above 80 degrees, I'd say it's a pretty good bet that it's a hot. Indeed, St. Louis is a DFA. We know the D stands for severe mid-latitude, the F for year-round precipitation, and the A for hot summer temperatures. But this climate type all by itself has a name as well. We look to the D climates here, the DFA as well as the DFB, the DW, the DWB, a bunch of them together are all lumped together and called humid continental. Indeed, many of these tend to be within the interiors of the continents, though we'll see there are some exceptions. But generally, they tend to be hot and humid in the summertime. If you've ever been to the East Coast or the Midwest in the summertime, you know that's a great way to describe it. Just humid. You're hot and sweaty most of the time. Looking at the global distribution, we see 
these humid continental climates in the interiors in our mid-latitudes. And interestingly, they, they go all the way to the east coast as well. And we'll talk about why that might be later. Okay, we've just begun our study of climate classification, but I highly encourage you to pause the video here and see if you can answer these questions. Consider taking notes as necessary. If there's any questions you cannot answer, you should pause the video and go back and figure them out.